Millions of kids are heading back to the classroom tomorrow, including mine. But are schools truly prepared to welcome them back? While much of the return to school debate has focused on mask mandates, what are schools doing about ventilation? After all, the virus is airborne and the Delta variant is particularly contagious indoors. Joining me now is a scientist and atmospheric chemist who has been sounding the alarm. Dr. Kimberly Prather is the director of the NSF Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry of the Environment at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Dr. Prather, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. We hear a lot about mask mandates, but you've said one of the top priorities for schools should be to clean the air. How do they do that? And how important is this whole issue of ventilation in our schools? Yeah, so just to be um, to be completely clear, assuming we all have masks, I mean, that's a given, right? In order to go back and keep schools open, everybody has to wear a mask, vaccinated, unvaccinated, um, with it being as contagious as it is. So then on top of that, we need what we call layers, more layers of protection. We need everything we can in our toolbox to help us. And so uh, ventilation is, you know, basically as simple as just cracking doors and windows, bringing in fresh air. We have little CO2 meters that we can use. I think you've heard me talk about that before. For, um, ways that we can see if the air is as fresh as it is outdoors because we know outdoors is much safer than indoors so we kind of want them to be closer together and then the other thing that we've really been pushing just that's very doable in the fall is filtration pulling that virus what if it does escape into the air pulling it back <clears throat> excuse me out of the air um, with filter filtration just simple HEPA filters no ionization no plasmas no fancy bells and whistles just filter the air you can pull with a HEPA filter a few of these sort of around the room which can be relatively inexpensive um, you can pull out you know 90 percent 99 percent of of the virus aerosols and and pollution yes. so just overall make healthier air Dr. Brader, you say that lunch is perhaps the riskiest part of the school day because the virus is in the air and at lunchtime the kids are indoors and unmasked. Uh, I know that these are a few ways you've said the risk can be lowered. Uh, move lunch outside if possible. Encourage kids to be quiet while eating and wait to chat until their masks are back on. Space kids out as much as possible. Make lunch as short as possible. I wonder how many schools are taking that advice on board and what's the risk if they don't? Well, I mean, again, the riskiest place is indoors and without masks and talking. So the, everybody knows that lunch is going to be the trickiest time. So, but not all places can go outside. In San Diego, we can go outside, and they're bringing in tents in a lot of places to do this. But this is the place, and some places are actually shortening the school day so people don't eat at school because this is the riskiest place, as you say. The WHO and the CDC were both slow to acknowledge the fact that COVID, that the coronavirus was airborne. In fact, last September, the CDC seemed to quietly acknowledge that it was airborne before quickly and quietly again removing that information from their website. For a long time, we were told to worry about droplets. We spent so much time disinfecting surfaces, washing our groceries. I wonder how big a blow to our COVID response do you think the failure by officials to acknowledge the airborne nature of this virus was? It's a big blow. And I mean, it, it would be bigger if scientists and engineers and medical doctors, we basically assembled a group through Twitter um, and we've been spreading the message as well as we can. It's not nearly as good as if CDC and WHO would be clearer in their message. I mean, one thing is once you acknowledge it's airborne, it's incredibly fixable. So we didn't have to be in this position um, if we had just, everybody just knew it's in the air and you have to get it out of the air and protect yourself from inhaling it. And so, yeah, it, it's a big blow, but because I think we stepped in, then you know, we've, we've actually been able to help luckily spread the message, but we're still hopeful that CDC and WHO will deliver a clearer message soon. And just on the schools and the issue of, you mentioned HEPA filters, one thing I wanted to ask you, What's the cost of this stuff? Like how, much would it, how much would it cost the U.S. government, federal government, state governments to make sure these things were in place? Yeah, I mean, if, the worst case is if you put it, it, there's a calculation done that if you put a HEPA filter in every single classroom in the U.S., it would be about a billion dollars. Um, but but also, but if people, what's happening right now is people are building their own. We, there's actually these things called Corsi Rosenthal boxes that we've been helping people build. So teachers, parents, they're doing fundraisers that you can build one for about $50 and run them in your classroom and they work. And so that is, you know, there are inexpensive solutions solutions for the fall. And we have to do something. We cannot send kids back without cleaning the air. 
No, we can't. It is truly a, a challenge. And I'm amazed that you're saying it's only going to cost a billion dollars to get HEPA filters in yes. place. And yet the U.S. government, school board, state governments haven't done that. Is that just, just bizarre? Um, Dr. Kimberly Prather, right. we will have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for your uh, insights and your campaigning on this issue.